did all that stuff, and I'm not even online, so I've got to do it all over again. So, okay. <laughs> all right. Well, good morning, New Hope Fellowship, and you that are viewing. But as I said, uh, what happens a lot of times, we don't start our service till about 9 o'clock because we do, we have four teams uh, of worshipers, and one of them, we use CDs. I don't care if we use CDs. I don't care if we have live music. I do care about this, that we go vertical. We're not here to kumbaya and just sing songs. I love all the songs that you have in K-Love and all that stuff. I like that. But I really like it when we, as the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the living organism, get to worship him personally. So if you'd stand with me, please. We have several families that are out on vacation today, but hey, maybe we, they, some other people that just got up might come in. So who knows? And we're going to have communion after worship as well. And then some of our new friends have to leave because they have some other commitments. So we, I appreciate the team. Uh, I, I, I will say this. Uh, Carla's a companionist. No, I'm kidding again. <laughs> so they, they take us vertically. I mean, that's the one. I want, you that are viewing, if you want to stand because it's to the Lord, it isn't just to be entertained. Even in, even in the message, the message, as we prayed, we had a couple prayer meetings already this morning to transform the heart and say, God, I want more. As deep, our deep heart would cry out to the deepness of God more. Amen? So would you bow your hearts with me? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We love you, Lord. Have your way, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Real quickly, what I did say is that uh, we have CDs. They will cut us off on CDs because of, of, the, of the CCLA, whatever requirements, and Facebook uh, will cut us off, YouTube. Not YouTube, but some, there's a, the algorithms or whatever. They just shut us down. So we say, okay. We'll just, we come in at 9 o'clock, and you will see the rest of the service. But not these guys. These guys are live all the way. So you're getting some good worship. God bless you. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to have fun and fellowship with one another. Amen? Amen. What's important, though, right? What God says. Amen. Amen. So let's be ready to... Sing the words in the song and know that there's such truth in the power of the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough.
have every failure, God. You have every victory. Ooh, oh, you say I am loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I am strong when I think I am weak. You say I am held when I am falling short. When I don't belong, when you say I am yours, and I believe, I believe what you say of me. So this was from my uh, devotional this morning, and I thought it was really appropriate to share. As a culture and as a church, we've taken the we can't change people to mean people don't change. And we've taken that we can't change people to mean that there's nothing that God can do to help them change. But when we buy that idea, people don't change, we deny both the human capacity for change and the power of God to change the human heart. And maybe most tragic of all, we free ourselves from the discomfort of a close relationship with someone who needs us, effectively abandoning the mission that God has set right in front of us. Grace allows time and space for transformation. People do change. People consumed by addiction can recover. Marriages can be saved. Children can survive dysfunctional homes. But it's a process. We forget this. Change takes endurance. God can do anything. Philippians 1.6 says, God began a good work in you, and I am sure that he will continue it until it is finished when Jesus Christ comes again. Amen. Amen.
nobody like you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord, for your love. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you never leave us nor forsake us, Lord God, and that you're always with us, Lord. We thank you for your sweet presence that we feel, Lord God. We just ask for more of you and less of us, Lord God. Fill us, Lord God. Instruct us and teach us and show us your ways. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Here I am waiting, abide in me. I Pray. Here I am longing for you. Hide me in your love and bring me to my knees. May I know Jesus. May I know Jesus, may I know Jesus more and more. Come live in me all my life, take over. Come live in me, I will rise. Take me, Lord, you're always there. And each passing moment, it's you that I adore. And I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Come live in me all my life, take over, come breathe in me, I will rise on eagles' wings. Come live in me all my life, take over, come breathe I will rise on eagles' wings. Hallelujah. Bless you, Jesus. Holy fire. desire for anything that is not of you and is of me. I want more of you and less of me. Empty me. Empty me. Fill. Won't you fill
the splendor of the king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice let all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light and darkness tries his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God age to age he stands and time is God had three in one. Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great God, how great is our God, sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God, how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Amen. Amen. Praise you, Lord. We sing a great praise to you. Thank you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Thank you, Bob and Carla. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. We're going to... We got... A few guests they have to leave, but we're going to have communion and their hearts with us because they got some other commitments. But praise the Lord. You know, worship. I, I love that passage out of uh, uh, the book of uh, Kings where Jehoshaphat, he was desperate. As a king that was desperate and, and uh, the king of Assyria was coming to destroy Israel or actually it was Jerusalem, because uh, this king of Assyria had already taken, there was two kingdoms in Israel because of sin with Solomon. Won't get into all the detail, but there was, a, there was a northern kingdom, Israel, and the southern kingdom, Judah. And they were divided because of Solomon, the great, wisest man ever lived, made two mistakes, and that was, Multiplied a lot of wives, had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And also, too, uh, he multiplied horses. God said, don't do that. The wives turned his heart against doing other things was wrong. So God said, I'm going to split the kingdom. He did. Well, down through this couple centuries, uh, the southern, the, yeah, the, the, the northern kingdom, which was Israel, 10 tribes, the king of Assyria finally came and and disperse them into Assyria because they too took their eyes off the Lord. They started to worship in astrology. They started to worship under uh, God of Moloch. He was a, God of Moloch was where they would actually take their kids and sacrifice their kids. And, and so God said, that's not, that's not my word. So he allowed them to, be, to go into exile. Then 100 years later, uh, King Jehoshaphat, he also... Uh, began to realize we need to follow the Lord. And Assyria started coming down into, uh, into um, Judah, which was the northern of uh, the southern kingdom. But he says, you know, what are we going to do? And he, he fasted, he prayed, and he says, and the Lord gave him a word through Isaiah, said, don't worry about this, I got this. And they sent worshipers out before the army. And when they got there, uh, the, the whole, the whole, 
army of, of the Syrians were killed. And so, you know, we worship the Lord before many things in our life. It's good to worship the Lord because when we do, and I don't know exactly how the Lord works things, but he works things out for our good. When we worship, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to praise you. And so that's what we did this morning. We worship, Lord, tenderized your heart because you're going through stuff. And when we take communion, we see what has been done for us. Jesus went before us, and he destroyed sin in our lives. If we believe in him. See, that's the beauty where Jesus would say, I will go before you, and I will lay my life down for my friends. That's what Jesus said. And when he said to his disciples at his last supper, he said, uh, I'm going to, you know, he didn't exactly say this is my last supper, but he did say uh, there's, you know, a traitor in the camp, and um, I want you to know that what we're going to do, these elements represent my body and my blood. And they're looking at them like deers in the headlight. And as Christians, now 2,000 years later, we see what Jesus has done. And Jesus gave, gave an instruction. He didn't actually command that you have to do it, but he basically said, do it as often as you would. He, says, he, said, he said that as often as you do this, you remember what I did for you. In the battle of sin, on this cross, is a place where Jesus would die for all humanity, not just believers. He died for all humanity. But unless you believe, repent and believe in him, that's the gospel, repent and believe in Jesus, you're not part of the kingdom. We're human, but the Bible says if you have the Son, you have life. If you don't have Jesus Christ, you don't have life. That sounds pretty, pretty um, what you might say, partial. and you're, you're, you're being very, what about all the others? Well, that's why the gospel has to go out to all the world, to everybody, because there's a lot of people that don't know Jesus, but sometimes only one person will know Jesus through your life, what he'd done through you, for you and now through you to them. And so at that night, Jesus, he took this bread. And if you'd open your, your elements up, the kids too. They, we were talking about the kids today about how we teach them. These kids are learning even what we're doing right now. Think, well, what about Sunday school? What about youth group? They, they'll learn there too. But they also learn by participating with the adults what communion is all about. Some people say, well, the, is the Lord in the elements? I believe he's everywhere. So let's just put that one to rest, whether it's transubstantiation or consubstantiation. I'm not even going to get into that, how the Catholics, Roman Catholics look at it or the Lutherans look at it. But as Christians, we believe that God is everywhere. He's in you, but he wants to be in every heart. But unless that heart is repentive and believes in Jesus, they're kind of on their own. God still lets them live, maybe 70, maybe 100 years. But after this comes a judgment. And God wants all to come to repentance and know him. And that's where he uses it. doesn't say, well, pastor, I hope you hit a home run this morning. You know, when you preach, this, these are appetizers. I take it from, you know, from another person. So well, these sermons are just appetizers. You hunger for the Lord as we pray for you. We had two prayer meetings this morning already. That God take us deeper. My heart is deep, but, I, but you're even deeper. Take from deep to deep. And so when... These kids here and are participating in the communion. They're learning. This is about Jesus. This bread represents his body. It was broken. He didn't break his bones, but his whole personality, everything was just, he was so despised and rejected by the Jews and the Roman authority, the government. And Jesus says, this is why I came. And so he's telling his disciples all this. Not just like that, but he says, this is my body which is broken for you as often as you eat this bread. Remember me. I did it for you and not only you, but the whole world. That's the beauty of Christianity. We're not a little secular little group. No, we, these doors are open. As my friend Cowboy Mike said, this is the church when we gather. This is just a building. It is. It's just a building. Nice building. We recognize that. We'll call it a church building or church, but it's really when we gather. And two or more gathered in my name, he's in our midst. And Jesus is right here with us. And I, I wish we could all see in the spiritual realm, in some ways it would be really scary, 
because we see a whole lot of angels and we just get fixated on them. That'd be kind of cool, wouldn't it? But, but he says, believe that I am. And I, it, the Bible says in Hebrews 11, 6, says, uh, says, by faith we believe that God is and that God will reward those that diligently seek him. You don't want to seek him? Don't. It's up to you. But for me and my house, I can't tell my daughters how to seek him, but I, I can at least encourage my wife. Let's do this together. And she's, my best friend says, I'm with you. Amen? And if your best friend's not here, your friends, your neighbor's not here, then continue to pray and cry for them. Because God wants all of us together. One day, the train will stop, your life will stop, and you'll be in heaven. But till then, we're going to continue to celebrate what he's done for my life and your life and the whole world. And if they would want to come to the Lord, then we welcome him in with humble heart, repent of heart, just fall in love with Jesus. And when you fall in love with him, guess what? You see the needs of others around you. That's the beauty of this walk. When you love him, your eyes are open. You begin to see, see in a spiritual way, the needs of others. And if they don't see your way, pray for them. And with humble heart, don't be critical. Be gracious and giving, forgiving and loving. Do the right things. And that's why we celebrate. This is a time of celebration. This isn't a morbid time. This is a time of celebration. I am free. Whom the Son says free, you're free indeed. So if you would open it and we'll hold this together and partake together, I like to pray. Father, I thank you. And those that are home, that maybe they have bread at home, blessings on this element that we hold before us. It represents your body that, was, that went to a cross, died for humanity. Not to start a religion. You're never into religion, Lord. You're into relationship, one-on-one, mono-mono, or a sister to, to Savior. Thank you, Jesus, that you came for this very purpose, and we celebrate it in Jesus' name. Eat all of it. And kids, big kids, little kids, this cup represents Jesus' blood. King and Jaden, this cup represents Jesus' blood. It was shed. When you put nails in your hand, if you were to hit your hand, it would bleed. If you were to put long thorns on the crown of your head, you would have blood coming down on your face. If you got whipped by somebody who didn't like you 39 times, Jaden, your back would bleed. The Bible says that by the stripes on Jesus' back were healed. You could take that in several ways. A miraculous way of healing the body. But I think more importantly, healing the soul. Where the soul gets well. You're not going to chase after the astrologers. You're not going to chase after palm readers. You're not going to chase after, you know, psychiatrists. Now, if you had to go to them because you're just really stuck, I, I, but don't go to astrology. Don't go to palm readers. Go to Jesus. He's the one who will, will heal your soul. That's what, Lord, heal my soul. It's broken. I'm, I'm hurting. You ever been depressed? I've been depressed like you. Jesus, the great counselor, wants you to be enlightened with his love. So when he took those stripes, he bled tremendously. I don't even know how the Lord made it to the top of Mount Calvary. The Bible does say there's a guy that named, um, I, I think it was, Math- I'm not sure of his name, Matthias or somebody in there, not Matthias, but uh, another man. He was, uh, they, some say he was Ethiopian, but a, but a, proselyte who turned into uh, went into Judaism and the Romans grabbed him to help him carry his cross he was he bled out almost but he lived another six hours on the cross until he said father forgive them all the Romans all the Jews forgive them they don't know what they're doing darkness was upon the face of the earth at that time but for a moment when Jesus would take the sins of the world. And he looked up to the Father and says, Father, it's finished. His mission was finished. 
Except now he lives in you and I, but he was finished to go to the cross. That's why Jesus came. We celebrate, oh, he came as a baby. We celebrate Christmas. It's wonderful. I love Christmas. But really, Good Friday's, in my opinion, better than them all in a lot of ways. Up to three days later, he resurrects. Good Friday's, he took my sin, your sin, away. And he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And Jesus was released from this this body, this house. Three days later, only God could resurrect. Jesus resurrected himself because the Father and the Son were, they said, yep, this is it. Father, Son, and Spirit, they don't work in tandem. Or Now, Jesus did come. The Son of God became Son of Man, but he came to die and his blood be shed for the remission of your sins. Would you hold your cup out, and we're going to thank the Lord for what he did for you and me and for the whole world. Father, I thank you that, Lord, from your heart you sent Jesus. For you, God, so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him, they should not perish, but will have everlasting life. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus, that you came. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you had moved in the hearts of those disciples becoming apostles. And then, Holy Spirit, you move in our hearts and now through our hearts to invite others into this great kingdom of God. We love you, Lord. Thank you for sacrificing, Jesus, your blood on the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Drink all of it. Amen. Would you pass those to the center aisle? And uh, you at home, it's good that you participate. Maybe later on on YouTube, it's up to you. Um, Wanda, did you want to do the offering on that? I mean, uh, commu- um, the uh, announcements? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. But on the pulpit here, so we see on the, on the viewer. On the pulpit, so we, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. All right, so I've been hearing some good stuff uh, on Thursday nights within the men's ministry and how the brothers are really diving in and how they're even, um, they're, they're different because they're asking a lot of questions of uh, God as, as Greg brings uh, forth the word in his uh, study with the men. I'm hearing some good stuff, and I praise God for that. So you men continue to come every Thursday. Bring your mission is to bring somebody with you. Find somebody, a coworker, or a neighbor, or a friend. Bring them on Thursday nights as well. Even for the women's Bible study, we had a glitch on. <laughs> we had a big glitch on Monday, but um, we're going to continue online. When? Okay, so not tomorrow, the following Monday. We'll be back on Zoom, uh, 7 p.m., and I think this would be our last video. The study has been a blessing. And then we're going to take a few months off and see what Sister Laura has planned for us women again. And I hope others will join in, okay? We'll join in because it's only an hour. And what we share, what we learn from the Bible study on Zoom, it stays there with us women. Um, and also for the children's ministries, we can get some help to help Barbara. Uh, the nursery for Laura as well, as well as the homeless. Uh, it's coming up in October. Uh, there'll be the second week in October. I'll be packing bags that Friday night. I don't know the dates, but I'll get that to you soon. Also, for uh, keep the missionaries in prayer, too, as well, as we give to mission next week. Uh, and also for the tithes and offering. You can go on the website, which is a lot easier for me. I don't know how many of you do it, but I, for me, it's just one click away. It's really simple. Um, you can do it that way, or you go to www.sandemus, I'm sorry, New Hope San Dimas Fellowship. San Dimas Fellowship. San, New Hope, no, I know where Bam gets confused. <laughs> New Hope Fellowship San org, 
Or you can get back there in that little envelope that should, you guys should have one inside of your uh, messenger here and uh, go ahead and give that uh, envelope and drop it off there. And anything else? Be good. <laughs> uh, praise God. So let's, let's, let's pray over the, uh, the, the tithes and offering. Heavenly Father, we just come before you. We thank you for this time, Lord Jesus, as we give to you, Father God. Somehow, like Bam says, you always make a way, Father God, and that's been a, it's been the happening in my life, Father God, and I just thank you for the things that you bless us with, the things that we need, not the things that we want, because we all want, but it's the things that you give us that we need to do whatever we need to do, Father God, not to want, but to need. We thank you, Father God, for blessing the, the tithes and offer. Let it multiply, Father God, and bless those who can't afford to this week to give, Father God. Once again, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lana. Well, we're going to be talking out of a series out of Romans, Romans chapter 13, 1 through 7. So I think you have some notes. If you don't have notes, Jesse can help you. And uh, who, who needs some notes? Everybody got their notes? So, uh, but it's an interesting study that we're going to be looking on in this particular uh, passage. If you want to turn with me to Romans chapter 13, uh, 1 through 7. Getting my cheat sheet out here. You know, I uh, appreciate my notes because a lot of times, um, a lot of us who, who come up here, um, not careful, we go down a rabbit hole and, but uh, try not to, but um, real quickly for the viewing audience and our are our, our children going to be going to Children's Church, Barb? The little ones? Okay. All right. Okay, I thought they were going to stay in with us. But they said, no, I want to get out of here. <laughs> okay. I uh, appreciate um, the ministries that we have here, Children's Ministry, Youth Ministry, Homeless, uh, the Samaritan Homeless Ministry, and uh, all that stuff. It's, it's good. So... Um, for you viewing at home, the title of this sermon is The Believer's Attitude Toward Government. Oh my gosh. Paul, you think, well, the Bible doesn't talk about politics, but the Bible does talk about politics. We get a lot of stuff about how the view of, of, of God's governance and laws are. But uh, <laughs> uh, we're looking at, as you see, you know, it's Romans chapter 13, 1 through 7. And... Uh, the theme here, as you see, is the call, God's call, God calls his children to be especially respectful of governing authorities unless governing authorities are against God's word. And that's where the crutch of it is when we get into politics, is it the politics that we, because there's, right now the, 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 um, the nations, it's kind of polarized, you know, but I think as Christians, we go with the word. You may have preferences, but if we stay with the word, I think we're safe as, as human beings personally. But some people not, may not like to see that that way because God's word, they don't even believe it. it's God's word. So you're at a disadvantage, but you know what? You're in the advantage of God when you follow God's word. So point one, God establishes the idea of government. Whoa, God does? Yep. Yeah, one through, verse one and two we'll look at. Point two, God uses governments to punish evildoers and rewards good doers. We'll look at that too. Verse 3 and 5. Point 3, God's will is for Christians. God's will is for Christians is to support the government and try to cooperate. You know that word try. We and and God really he he puts he puts governances in place for your safety. And so just for your, my viewing audience here, the viewing audience that's viewing, uh, I may not get to this later, but let's talk about things of importance. Remember, we call government officials public servants. Another point, some of them are a disgrace and a sad bunch of public servants. We'll kind of look at that a little bit. But many are wanting to do good and are out to serve. Is that my phone? How dare they? <laughs> That's my phone. Well, I'll over. It can only ring a couple more times. So Jeremiah twenty nine through seven. Somebody might be viewing. And say I'm going to interrupt him. 
<laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Oh, Beach, I knew that they'd hang up. Jeremiah 29, 7 says this, But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. And then Timothy, we, this is very important. Thanks, Greg. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplication, prayers, and intercession, and the giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, like our president, and for all who are in authority, our Congress, our Senate, Supreme Court, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is, the, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, modern governments... They all have an awful big responsibility. All of them do. And uh, it's, it's, it's easy to be a negative toward the authorities that are there and the governments. But I think it's important that as Christians we, we know what we're talking about when the Scriptures. That's why it's so important to read the Word. And we get political many times. I was in a political conversation, a big one last night, and it's like, okay, I mean, there is, we get it. There, there's, there's, we have views but I think it's really important that we know the Word of God. John Piper said this, One of the crucial issues before the church in America today is this. Should we be American with a pinch of religious flavoring, or shall we be Christ's people with a pinch of America flavoring? I think we need to be Christ's flavor to America, you know, in, in the place where we're at right now, not where the governance controls the Christian but the Christians is praying for the governance of this land because it is dark right now. In fact, the Bible says in the, in the last days, people are going to be calling good evil and evil good. It's like, and the, the young people that are here, you know, you're hearing this stuff and going, well, I don't see it. Well, when all of a sudden the authorities start to take away rights that mom and dad had in the past, they're going to be struggling and say, what's going on, mom? And moms and dads, we need it encourage them. Grandmas, grandpas, we need to encourage them because they may not understand the Word of God. That's why God has used the family, the family unit. They say that even in Chicago, the percentage, like 70% of the, a lot of these young people that are shooting uh, black on black, they don't have a father in the home. They don't have a guidance. So we as parents, especially believers, to raise these Young people up in the ammunition of the Lord because the enemy doesn't care about what color ethnicity you are. They just know that you're made in the image of God and they will try to destroy the image of God. That's what the enemy tries to do. But Jesus said, he says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. He says, I come to destroy the works of darkness. That's what Jesus came. Not just die for sins, by the way. He didn't come just for the cross. But he had a beef. You're not going to take my creation and take it to hell. I'm going to pay for their, their, their shortcomings. And Jesus, yeah, there was, there's a spiritual battle all the time. All the time, even for us, God's called us into this kingdom to, to do battle. We are citizens of two kingdoms, friends. Our heavenly kingdom is the most important of the two. Biblical Christianity is about conviction and character and political compromise. We our politics, many times we have to compromise and say, no, I'm not going to do this because it goes against God's word. We're, we're not going to compromise and say, oh, okay, well, just because the government says this. We, at times, have to stand up. There's a thing called the Johnson Amendment Act in, in 1958, and Johnson passed this bill because he was afraid that uh, the pastors would start to sway the voters at that time. And so they put a, 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 this amendment in that they didn't want pastors to get involved in politics. So that's pooey. The Bible, the Bible wants us to. And you're going to read, we're going to see the reading in this in just a minute where Paul talks about politics in these first seven verses. Very interesting. But, but what it does it mean to isolate ourselves from our society? It doesn't mean that we become anti-government. We live in a place we have to have government to protect us. Nor does it mean Christians should not be involved in politics. We should be involved in politics. Well, we, we just want to hear from the pulpit. 
one of the great um, commanders in the body of Christ. Jesus is the head shepherd and pastor. Is Jack Hibbs. Many, he has a big, big church over in Chino. And a lot of people, they get a lot of his view of what, uh, you know, what's right according to the word. I think that's right. Now, I, I don't, I, you know, I, there are certain things in politics just drives me crazy. But I want to stand what is good for humanity and for the body of Christ. One of the things that I, and I'll bring it up a little bit later, is, is the right to life. This ban, I said, we love life. We love life in the womb. And so uh, that's one of the things we, we can stand up against. If we don't, there's going to be some uh, sad grandmothers and, and sad mothers in the future when they terminate their children. I don't understand that, but there again, there's things that uh, I think that happens in their mind and in their soul and convenience. I just can't have this baby. Give the baby up. We have a, a, gra- a great-grandmother here who is blessed beyond imagination because her, her granddaughter gave this child up to a family who could not have children. What a beautiful story that is. Won't get into it. She's here, but I know that she's smiling in her heart because she sees that little Benton all bent for Jesus, you know. So it's great. But would you stand with me, please, as we read the Word of God? Those that are falling asleep, they've got to stand up and wake up, right? No, I'm kidding you. So... Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. So you at home, if you want to get off your bed, I'm kidding you too. Uh, because it's the word of God. And the word of God is it's very powerful. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. We'll break all this down in a minute. Therefore... Whoever resists the authority resists the ordinances of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister. The the minister is those who are in authority, like policemen and stuff like that. For he is God's minister to, to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because for this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to do this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their dues taxes, to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Speak to us, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, that first point, God, God established the idea of governance. It's interesting that in the very beginning, Noah was told when he came off the ark, Noah comes off the ark, right? And so there's no more humanity, but there's a lot of animals out there. And he also forewarns Noah when he begins to repopulate through consummation. He had uh, three sons, uh, three daughter-in-laws. And Noah did not have any more children, but it does say that through Shem, Ham, and Japheth, humanity came forth again. It's like, whoa, okay, that's pretty heavy. It was Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And, and you, can, you can Google that for yourself and look at a bunch of how did the strands of humanity come. But he told Noah, Noah in, in Genesis 9, 6, he, 6, he said this, for warning him, beginning a governance. In other words, we need to govern ourselves, or you need to govern yourself too, but this is how I'm going to work it, Noah. Whosoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. God was saying to Noah, I'm putting a warning here. If, if from your descendants, they begin to turn on one another, because still in the heart of man, we, we have, the, the heart is desperately wicked. It is selfish. What about me, myself and I? What about my four and no more? And we're not other-centered. But God had grace on, upon Noah, and he had him build this ark. It took 120 years. And so he basically foretold Noah, 
there needs to be laws here. And even put laws on the animal kingdom. He put the fear of man on animals, if you didn't know that. I wouldn't go swimming around a white, white shark in the ocean, you know, especially if he's hungry. But basically, animals are afraid of us instead of them all of a sudden coming and attacking us. I mean, there's a time you might corner an animal, and they might turn, but basically, they're gonna, they get away from you. It's like, whoa, that bear ran away. Get big before them, and they take off. These are rare cases. And, and by the way, in the shark kingdom, they say you, it's, it's easier to get hit by a, a lightning bolt than to be attacked by a shark. But we've heard about those situations. But God gave this foundation of governance. And these, there's four foundations that it's very important. One is love for God. God's kingdom. Jesus said, if you seek first my kingdom, I will give you, if you in other words, not, I don't want you religious, but I want you to seek me. You see, Hebrews 11.4 says this, 11.6 11, says this, faith is this, we believe that God is, I, I can't describe him, I'm sorry friends, he's, he's, he's here, no words can describe the glory of God, you can't, nobody's seen God in that sense, God has, he's lightened it down when he, he appeared to, know, uh, to, uh, to Abraham. He appeared at other places. We call that a theophany. He just doesn't dumb himself down. We just couldn't handle the glory of God. I, no man, no preacher, nobody on the planet can say, well, I got God figured out. But Bible says this in Hebrews eleven six. He says, for we believe that God is. That's the first takeaway. And he will reward you if you seek him. I don't have time for him. God said, well, you're on your own, Bobby. I, I want to seek you, Lord. We, we prayed back in the room. Lord, my heart, I, I want it to be deep, but Lord, you're even deeper. I want more of you. Amen? Amen. I want more of him. Yeah, yeah. Are you less of him? Friends, one day you're going to face him. So now is the time to prepare to meet him. Well, I want to prepare for my pension, my retirement. I'm tired of this. I want to, on my bucket list, this. Friends, we should really be preparing and hungry for him. And by the way, when you seek first his kingdom, he says, I'll give you all of it. Don't be jealous of the Joneses. Seek him. As Jesus said, and I will give you what the Gentiles. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. Doesn't matter what color you are, you're Gentile. And so he speaks to all people. If you seek first my kingdom, I will give you all the things that the Gentiles and everyone seeks after. That's a nice promise. Well, I can't afford to come to church. I can't afford to give. I can't afford. Friends, and the next thing is, of these things that he founded, is marriage. Marriage between a man and a woman. Not the LBDGQ. I, everybody's got gay members in their family. I do. Uh, you know, it's like, what do you do? Hey, that was their choice. But God made male and female. It's not like uh, you know, these, all these different things. Well, what are you? Are you an other? That's where I think, as Christians, we can, we can have a dissent and say something about that. Oh, you want to have a little argument, they'll say? Yeah, and that's when you bring the Word of God. And the Word of God begins to speak through you, and it begins to cut them. And that's why we bring up Jesus. Because Jesus, there's, in, in uh, Acts uh, uh, 4, 12, it says, There's no other name given among men whereby men may be saved, the name of Jesus. So we, we know, and, and so you say, Well, I don't know how to preach. I, give him Jesus. And let the Holy Spirit take that name. And they'll remember, well, gee, what did, what did, Jesus, what, Jesus, that's what happened to me, and it may happen to you. It's like, do I have Jesus? And it begins to change, and that place in marriage is so important. We don't marry another man. He didn't make us Adam and Steve or Lucy and Lily, you know. He made us Adam and Eve, male and female. And then another foundation because, but like I said earlier about Chicago, with all this problems happen in Chicago. 70% of the men, and probably a lot of problems that are, there where there's a lot of victimization, these men, and even women get in trouble because they don't have a father figure. Or their parents just ad uh, uh, abandon them, and they're on their own. And praise God, we've, we've heard of many stories in, your, in one's journey how God has rescued the prodigal son or daughter. Isn't that beautiful? God's, he's... He's not, well, I'm just going to hang around the pulpit where the preacher is. I don't believe in that theology. He's, he is looking for a heart that says, God, I'm in need. Help me. If you're there, that one word, help. One word, help. If it's from the heart, it means a lot. Help. 
That will change. And God sees your heart and he begins to move. And the church is so important. That's the foundation. <coughs> Excuse me. The church is very important. I don't need church. I hear people from time to time say, I don't need to go to church. And they're a bunch of hip. All they want is money. Give me, give me, give me. Well, it's really, it's in your giving where you're blessed. The Bible doesn't say give so the church can, you know, keep the doors open. But there's, there's collateral blessings on that. You give like a person who has a farm and you have the, you buy, go down to the hardware store and you get seed. And you, you invest in the seed and then you invest in the ground. And what happens? It multiplies. And you get blessed. And then all of a sudden the blessings, the collateral blessings is like, you know, you're making money, but also you're blessing others. You're giving it away. And the next one, foundation, is governance. Governments are important. We have government. And, and these, these four are healthy places for, for a nation, for government at its best, to have a, a God-fearing nation. I mean, this, the Constitution was built on, on God-fearing principles from the Word of God. If you've ever, never been to Washington, D.C., it's amazing what you get to see there. Everywhere you see, you see Scripture. It's amazing. It's like, and, and they're trying to take the Ten Commandments, the blocks out of some courthouses. You go to D.C., there's Scriptures everywhere because our founding fathers were God-fearing people. They weren't perfect for no, no means. Nobody is but one who died on this cross for your imperfection. But in the process, that was built off of the Word of God. And so God sets these principles up for government you know, to God, fear God. And, and what happens is we don't have God set up in these principles. The, the governance begins to be weakened. Kingdoms begin to be weakened. And so God wants to approve of these places that we call governance. Now, there's times when God has used bad kings. There's p times God uses presidents that aren't good. And Daniel 2.21 says this, he, God, changes times and seasons. He removes kings or presidents and sets up kings or presidents to give wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So it's all God. I mean, still, any, I mean, we voted, we had a big election, we have ones coming up, but we pray, God, and we look at those ones that are, are running. What's their principle of what the Word of God would say? I would declare I'm, I'm more of an independent. I, I don't, I'm not, I, I, Lord, I'm independent. I want what's right according to your word. I want to be an independent. I don't want to be Democrat or Republican. Lord, what does your word say? Now, I'll vote either way if the, it's conducive to the word of God. In Daniel 4, 32, the most high God rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he wills. Now, you say, well, if you like Biden or not, or President Trump, or God, I, I, it's, it's a deep subject. But we have a right in a democracy to vote. And God wants us to vote. He vote, believed in vote. In fact, the 12th apostle, when Judas betrayed Jesus, they, they had a vote. And a guy by the name of Matthias became the 12th apostle. So God's into voting. Jesus said this to Pontius Pilate. When Jesus was being questioned by Pilate, and he says, Pilate said, well, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? I, I'm a big guy. I'm Pontius Pilate. Do you not know, Jesus, Pilate said this, do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him and said, you would have no authority over me at all at all, unless it has been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has a greater sin. Jesus was basically saying, hey, even God has allowed you, Pilate, to be in authority. It, that, those are deep things, amen? amen. To say, wow, that, you know, it's, it's and so as Christians, in, in verse 2, we see this, that uh, Paul goes on, he's trying to encourage the saints, and he says, therefore, Whoever resists authority resists the ordinances of God. Because we're looking, well, everything's appointed by God. But then again, there comes to a place that God's asking us to not resist authority of the ordinances of God. And those who resist will be, be brought into judgment. But there are times that we have, we have to 
have a resistance because they're out of God's will. In Acts 4, 18 through 20, Peter and John were called on the carpet because they said, Jesus is the way. He was crucified and he's the risen Lord. And the, and the, and the Jewish leader said, stop it. You can't use that name. Why are you saying that? You're going to cause a, a riot. And there was basically a rebellious attitude in Peter and John because they said this. So they called Peter and John and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, and this is where it's Christians, yeah, we, we can get into politics, but we're going to get into what God's word says. And they said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge, you judge. You religious people, and even the governance. We, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And you, my friends, have seen and heard what Jesus had done in your life. And so you have that right to, yes, step in that political arena and say, the word of God says this. And later on, Peter was also with the other apostles. They, they were, went back to church, the, the synagogue, and they're talking about Jesus. And all 12 of them were incarcerated. And then they did the same thing to them. And then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And so it's obvious that it comes to a time that we, we can resist. To resist is because it doesn't match up with the word of God. When rulers put themselves in the place of God by legislating moral or spiritual position, all acts have moral and spiritual roots, all of them, which is contrary to the revealed position of God Resist is warranted. We are warranted if we resist certain things. I, every third Saturday as a church, we try, excuse me, we try to go down to Pomona and we resist this abortionist. I don't call them doctors no more. They're not doctors. They may know how, but they're abortionists. They're just as bad as, as Auschwitz, murdering human beings. We were all in that place once because of convenience, and, and, and pleasure, and they just, I don't want this, so they terminate, such as that of allowing abortion. Then resistant. We can resist. We have a voice, but which the church is an attempt of this immoral standard that society says, well, it's her choice. We need to restore God's standards to society. Amen? Amen. And, we, and you say, well, I'm not going to get involved. Friends, what if you were in the womb? Wouldn't you want somebody to get involved for you? Amen. Every human being is made in the image of God. That's what he told Noah. He says, if you, because you're made in the image of God, if one takes another one's life, their life will be taken. Now, that would be a harsh thing to say. Well, Mom, and you fathers who fathered to consummate with this child, you know, if you abort, you'll die. That's, that's a harsh one. I, uh, that's, but, but God said it to Noah in Genesis 9, 6. If you take a human life who's made in his image, that little baby was created. I mean, it's, it's, I'm not going to get off the top of it, but we, we have pictures. They're made in the image of God. Well, no, they're just tissue. They're just stuff. Really? Sir T. M. Taylor in 1961 said this, the obedience which the Christian man owes to the state is never absolute, but at the most partial and contingent. It follows that the Christian lives always is in tension between two competing claims. That is, certain circumstances of disobedience to the command of the state, government, may be not only at a right, but also a duty to resist. This has been classical doctrine ever since the apostles declared that they have, ought to obey God rather than men. Amen? I mean, this is deep stuff. Because, well, we don't, don't get involved. Friends, follow the word. Whether you're blue or red, I'm Christian. I follow the blood of Jesus. And so our, in our country, we don't have a king. We have a governing authority that's vested in legislation, executive offices, and, and courts. And they're important. But we buy in, we cooperate what's going on with them, and we pray for them. It's reasonable. Submission. We want to submit. We, we need government. Can you imagine if we had, didn't have government? There'd be anarchy. So God put that there so we wouldn't start attacking one another. Ecclesiastes 5.8 says this. If you, 
if you see in a providence the oppression of the poor and violation of the justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at this matter, for the high officials are watched by higher and those even higher than them. In other words, these authorities that they have over us, they have authority over them, and they're being moved to make sure that we have laws and orders. I'm all for governance, but I will resist if it goes against the word of God. That's important. We need government. Not man's idea, but God's idea. Amen? We, well, this is my idea, so some governor comes up or some president comes up, this is my idea and this is what we're going to do. What about God's word? That's why we're to pray for all those in authority. We should try to be positive toward government and encourage it to live up to God's given mandates. Amen? I mean, that's what's important. And so point to God used governments to punish evildoers and rewards good doers. So we, we, you know, yeah, I think we should fear justice in a way because authority, if we do wrong, then, then be willing to take it. So God has this, these places in verse 3, real quickly. It says, For I say, though, through the... Um, so I say, for the grace of God, oh, I'm sorry, I'm over on the wrong page. For rulers are not a terror of good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. So it's important that we realize that the, the governance we have in, in around us, if we do what's right, what, why should we fear? I mean, if, I mean, you know that all of a sudden, if you don't have your seatbelt on, and you see black and white there, you start to panic. Oh, my gosh, I didn't want to wear that because I was too lazy to put it in right away. Or if you're speeding, and so you see a cop up there, and you're going, you know, 10 miles over the speed limit, you get nervous because the governance of the rule is for your good to stay within those rules. And so it's for us. And so when you're doing the right thing, you don't have to worry. The conscience is fine. But it's when you're doing things, you're taking from other people, that's not yours. Yeah, I think your conscience is going to start to bother. We must obey God rather than men. That's what John and Paul said. But, you know, there's also another place where there's a, uh, the midwives. We all, ladies, know what a midwife is. Some of the men may not know. But a midwife was, back in the day, you had women doctors that knew how it all works. And the women would help deliver those babies. But one guy by the name of Pharaoh realized that Israel was, or at that time, the Hebrews, they weren't called Israelites yet, but the Hebrews were actually getting out of population. So he told the midwives, abort the kids, kill them. And the, mid the midwives said, we, no, we will not. And they didn't obey the king, in, uh, the pharaoh of Egypt. And Daniel, by the way, real quickly on that point, Daniel, too, uh, had friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you go back to the 60s, there was a song called you know, the, the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where they were told that they needed a bow to the image of, she, uh, of Nebuchadnezzar. And what happened was that they said, no, we're going to bow only to the Lord. And so they said, if you don't, we're going to throw you in this fiery pit. And they were. They were thrown in there because they would not go and uh, bow before this image that Nebuchadnezzar, who is this huge ruler of this, I mean, this just powerful empire that he created. And, um, and they said, even if God doesn't deliver us, he may, but he may not. We're not going to bow to you. So he said he stoked up the fire, and he had these guys throw them in there, and the fire wasn't touching Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but the ones that threw them into the fire, they, they were consumed. And all of a sudden, because Nebuchadnezzar was so upset, he, said, he went to the execution. He wanted to see it. So he's looking for we threw three in there, but there's four in there. It looks like the Son of God. It was Jesus, a theophany of seeing Jesus in that fire. So it's important that when we do wrong, we're going to pay it. But if we, if we dis earn civil disobedience because we feel it goes against our conscience, friends, it's okay, even against this government we have in this state and this nation. And, you know, someday our rights may be even more impaired because the laws will say, you can't even say Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. What do you mean that Jesus is the only way? He, that's what the Bible says, and I believe it. And he's coming back. And unless you repent and believe in Jesus Christ, there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. How can you talk that way? Throw him in jail. Get that preacher out of there. And that happened in Idaho. They were preaching about Jesus. Idaho, a state that's conservative because they're on federal land, they stop these preachers from preaching the truth. 
How can it happen? Because there's a, there's a kingdom of darkness too that's not the kingdom of God. And it wants to mess with your lives, your families, your marriages, the church. But Jesus put a stand. He says, the gates of hell shall not prevail in my church. Because you know why? His saints, you who are sanctified, you believe in him, you're going to stand up and you'll be praying for your loved ones, your husbands, your father, uh, fathers, mothers, neighbors. And God says, well, you'll say, well, God, why can't you just do this? God says, because I want to partner with you. I want to be with you. You assist me, but you be with me too. And so we go in, and yes, we're attacking the kingdom of God. And you, it doesn't matter, male or female, preacher, you're all minister of the Most High. The Great One lives in you. And he's going to help you through every part of your life to hold back the darkness in your families. Don't give up, friends, for your loved ones. Don't give up. Don't give up. Point three, God will is for Christians to support government and try to cooperate with it. We pay taxes, friends. Don't cheat on your taxes. I mean, if you can get write-offs, get them. That's legal. Don't cheat on them. Because God says, Jesus himself says, when somebody says, well, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Jesus says, yeah. Give to God what's God's and give to Caesar's what's Caesar's. And Paul is basically quoting Jesus here when Paul is saying in verse, uh, verse uh, 5, he says this, he says, he says that therefore you must be subject not only to those wrath but also to those for conscience sake, but because of this, you also pay taxes. So we pay taxes because it's good. And it, it, your conscience is going to feel right because you're, you're supporting the government, but also, too, it keeps us safe. I, I don't even know what it would be like if, if we had a, another BLM thing and everybody started going crazy and attacking us because we didn't see their point of view. It would be really scary. It really would. People would be bringing out their AR-14... 15s. I don't have one, and I don't want one, but some people do. But, you know, just think we didn't have the authorities around us. Went by some friend's house, and there was a bomb scare. And the precious ministers of God, in that one sense, that bear the sword, they went all door to door and warned them there might be a bomb threat down the street for our safe, safety. And they all, most, a lot of them evacuated somewhere in this room. You can ask them later. <laughs> but we have them. We pay taxes to pay for, their, for their, their overhead and stuff like that. So it's very important that we understand. It's, we, we honor that authority by paying those taxes. And so, and by the way, real quickly, I want to make note. Uh, these ministers, these policemen, they're ministers of God. I, when I see them, I say, thank you for your ministry. They're... they're, they're there are servants, you know, serving servants. They're ministers, though, but they, not like this, we're ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't, we don't fight fire with fire. We fight darkness with prayer and authority in Jesus' name. But if you get out of line and you break the law, I mean, really break the law, they will draw their swords, and they will, they will punish you if you continue to be disobedient to what is right. And, and uh, a lot of policemen, by the way, they, they use that particular passage, uh, Romans 13, 5, or 13, 4, they, that they are God's minister, avengers, to execute wrath on him who practices evil. They put that on there. I, I have a family member that he's all tatted up, you know, he's a policeman. So he has that on there. It's like, get over yourself. But he, he, he feels like he's really a minister of that type. But you know, people don't care how much you know, but do you care? And even these policemen, they need to dial it down and speak before they do something crazy because a lot of unjustness goes on even with these people that get their adrenaline up and they can hurt people in, in our culture, which we've seen that with, with uh, George Floyd. So it, it's sad that we had to all go through that. But I don't believe everything that happened with that was right, but I, I, that policeman was totally wrong what he did to George Floyd. It was so wrong. And they, he deserved to go to prison for the rest of his life, what he put this nation through. That's my opinion, but you can have your own. But also, too, uh, we, we respect the office uh, as we uh, give this place, as we pay our taxes forward and stuff like that. So 
Also, too, because of the freedoms we have, I had an experience with Jehovah Witnesses on 4th of July. I had a water main that broke. It had to be repaired. And uh, these Jehovah Witnesses were walking by me, and it was 4th of July. The guy that did my, my, my main line, he didn't charge me extra, but they're right in the middle of all this work. These Jehovah Witness ladies walk by, and, and they can I give this? No, I don't need this, but I, I know this, that, that Jesus loves you. And I believe that he's God. And by the way, are you going to celebrate the 4th of July today for the freedoms that you have? They looked at me like all of a sudden, I, there is like middle of the night, and I hit headlights on me, just stood there. See, they, they will not, they will not uh, give the Pledge of Allegiance. They won't celebrate Christmas. They won't celebrate Easter. They're on another agenda. But 4th of July, men and women have died for the freedoms I get to have and you get to have to share the truth of Jesus. And they go out there and knock on your door. God bless them if they, if they turn to Jesus, but that's a false religion and a doctrine. They don't believe that Jesus is, is God. They don't believe that, they believe that he, is, he is, I will tell you, you can Google yourself, they believe he's Michael, uh, the archangel incarnate. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to get into it, but, but there again, they did not respect the freedoms we have in this government that we have that gives them the freedom to do that. That was amazing. I don't like to tease them, but I do like to bring up certain things to them to bring them back into this kingdom of God, which is through Jesus Christ. So we need to contribute to the governance with our taxes. Voting is important. Some say, well, I I can't vote. I'm not even a citizen. Get your citizenship then. I know people that aren't even, so they, they get all the, 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 uh, the, the immigrants that are coming across the border, they get your citizenship. If they cut you loose and say, hey, you know what, you're in a great country, I'd come across too illegal if I could, but once I'm in, I'm hoping some type of amnesty, then become a citizen, amen? Why not? Because what great country we have. Because if we don't, we have anarchy, friends, we're in trouble. And it could happen. So, you know, Yes, it's important to know what's going on around you. I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to say I'm a news junkie, but I want to know what's going on. I do. Don't just bury your head in the sand and say, well, I just, I'm working for my retirement. I'm working for my wife. I'm working for my kids. Friends, there's more than that. There's more than just your four and no more. God has a purpose, and he brought you into this kingdom, not just to have a, an American way of life like the Joneses. Who cares about the Joneses? Be who you are. Be who you are. You are are made in his image, male and female. I cannot get in the the depth of God because I don't know how to get in the depth of God. He's too wonderful. He's too beautiful. My words are, they fall short. But I got to worship him this morning. Lord, you love me. And he loves all. So we continue to grow from this appetizer grow. And so in closing, we need to pray for all men. And I will quote this scripture again that you have on your notes. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. Therefore I exert, I exhort, first of all, the supplications in your notes, prayers and intercession. You're praying, Lord, help our president. And those that, whether you like him or not, help him, change your mind like you, his mind like Nebuchadnezzar's. I won't get into that either, but prayer changes and, and giving thanks be made for all men, your neighbors, your family. For kings or presidents, for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and a peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. In other words, man, I got peace. My conscience is good. You know, if your conscience feels good, there's peace. Isn't that neat? Have peace of mind. You sleep. You men, you get into pornography, you're not going to sleep well. If you get into, if you're doing stuff that's not right, ladies, you're, you're doing all this back dropping of different things about family and you're not going to sleep because because your conscience isn't going to bear witness in peace. Peace is a big thing. That we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and it's acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, Jesus, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so friends, we're here closing. You that are viewing if you never repented and said, Jesus, come in my life, it's, it's, that's, it's, that's the simplicity of the gospel. <laughs> what? 
You mean I don't have to sign up and say, I become a member and I'm going to be doing this and tithing and being this? No, no, no. Not in this church. I think the church of Jesus Christ would say this. Just come. Come as you are. And I'll fill you up. And you'll be so full that out of you, as Jesus himself, and I'll quote, will come out of you like rivers flowing. And it'll splash all over your community like, like the woman at the well. He said, if you drink this water, me. Jesus called himself water. He called himself bread. He called him. He, he, there was many compound names that Jesus had. But he says, if you believe that I am speaking to you, I told you much stuff to the woman at the well. He says, out of you will flow rivers of living water. And she changed the whole community called in Samaria. And God will change your community too. And you that are viewing you don't have to do anything any pastor says. You don't have to do anything God says. But I think it would be worth it to really do what God says. Pastors are just jumping on and regurgitating the word of God the best that they can. Does that make sense? We're doing the best that we can. But it's up to you. You don't have to follow God at all, but it's up to you. It's up to you to say, Lord, I need you. Help! And God will. He'll be like the prodigal son's father. And he heard that cry. And what did the prodigal son's father? He ran to the son. He ran to him. Hugged him. He'll hug any one of us if we truly, with an open and honest heart, call on his name. So would you stand with me, please? This is, this is always your call. The pastor's the pastor invitation, but it's your call to follow the great call. And maybe there's someone here this morning and even viewing, Lord, I want to rededicate my life. I want to go deeper with you, Jesus. We seem to have that theme in our prayer times this morning twice. Lord, give us deepness, Lord. Not religion, but deepness with you. So, Father, we come with a humble heart. Thank you, Lord, that you, you put everything in, in orchestrated order. You're the God of order, not a God of disorder. Not a God of confusion, but a God of purpose and plan. Not just now, but all eternity. Help me, Lord. Help all of us to follow your plan to the T, to the best of our ability by your Spirit. I ask this, Lord, in Jesus' love in the name, and everyone would say, Amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you downstairs. See you next.